going to talk about roses. If you've ever been to my classes, you know roses are my favorite. I love roses. Um, this is the second class on roses we've done this, uh, this year, actually. Uh, we really had a run on roses this year. They were really popular. Everyone wanted them. Uh, we were not expecting that, and the growers were not either. They actually ran out of roses to send us. <laughs> so we still have some left, but uh, not like we normally do. So they were really popular this year. So uh, most of you, I think, planted your roses already back in spring, or maybe you already had them from previous years. Uh, so I think today we're, we're going to be talking a lot about the maintenance of them, um, problems that you're probably encountering now, problems you're going to be encountering very soon so that you can prepare for them. And um, if you have any questions about uh, planting or maintenance, feel free to raise your hand and, and uh, the whole class will benefit. So I've got a little selection of, of roses up here. And you can see there's a, we've got a few different types. Uh, something we've been getting a lot of questions about is the planting. Uh, now, for those of you who, have, who haven't met me yet, I'm actually the head planter. My name is Ella, and I'm the one that runs the planting department, sends the trucks out, goes out myself, does the planting. So I've been in all your different areas. I know what your soil's like. Those of you who, who have moved in recently, you went to put a shovel in the soil and found out <laughs> that's not so easy. So that's why we have a planting department. Uh, you can actually, when you purchase anything from us, you can at the same time just uh, pay a fee at, right there at the cash register for that plant to be planted. We'll come out and do it for you. And we've got all kinds of fun power equipment to get it done. So <laughs> we'll, we, can, we can get your roses, big trees, whatever, into the ground. So I've been, we've planted, Oh, uh, Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, Prescott, Dewey, um, those areas we're in a lot. Uh, we've even gone, gone farther than that on occasion. We've been in Yarnell, Sedona. So we've seen so many different soil types. In general, we tend to see a lot of clay. For most of you, you've got this very, very dense clay with a lot of rock in it. That's what most of you have. Uh, some of you around the base of Thumb Butte, it's a little bit sandier, it's a, it's a disintegrated granite. Um, and you'll notice that even though it has a sandy appearance, sometimes it compacts really hard. And you need something more than just a shovel to get through it. You, you're pulling up the pickaxe at the very least. A lot of times we have to jackhammer through it. So we see a lot of issues with, with soil here being very, very hard, whether it's the clay or the disintegrated granite. Very, very hard but it can be worked with. So we want to talk about how you can make that work so that you can plant your roses or whatever it is you're wanting to plant, whether you do it yourself or have us do it. Here's how, the first thing you want to do, I'm going to pick up one of these, grab this guy. Right here is a carpet rose. So um, this is something that it doesn't grow very, very tall. This is something that is great for border beds, uh, for putting in front of taller plants, um, for using when you just need low plants, you know, don't want to block the windows, things like that. Uh, it's called either a carpet rose or a ground cover rose. It spreads about three, four feet wide, but only gets about maybe a foot, foot and a half tall. So not a big rose at all. Beautiful rose though, it will get just covered in all of these, these small roses and just be covered in it. We're kind of, it's kind of coming out of its little summer uh, breather right now. You'll notice this every year you go into that hot dry part of the summer and your roses will start to peter off a little bit and then they'll kick back up they just need a, a, a they have a little cycle that they got to go through and it's really good for them to go through that cycle during that hotter part because the petals have a tendency to dry up so you'll notice every, all of these are just about to explode into bloom I mean, any day now, they're just gonna go crazy. This actually has buds all over it right now. It's going to be gorgeous in a few days. Does that have a smell? Does this have a smell? All the roses have a smell. I would say the carpets may not be quite as fragrant as say the old fashioned roses or the hybrid teas, but uh, generally, yeah, there's, a, there's something of a smell and it can depend on the variety as well. So this right here, let's say we wanted to plant this. The top of the root ball is right here, just a 
about an inch and a half below the rim. What I would want to do is dig a hole about two to three times as wide as this root ball. Not any deeper though, I want to make it the same depth. And that's it. So that the, the soil level that it's got right now is the soil level that it wants to have. That needs to be level with the ground. Um, some of you may have uh, noticed that some of the plants in your neighborhood are having a little trouble. We're in monsoon season right now, we're getting a lot of rain. Plants that got planted too deep in the ground, they're starting to suffer. You'll see die off. Uh, you'll see uh, trees, especially. Uh, things that have real woody trunks, you'll see them start to die off. Stems will start to, to rot. Bark will rot off. So, all because they were planted too deep, so don't go too deep. Better too high than too low. You can't really hurt it by going too high. Sometimes it's even a good idea, if you're having trouble with drainage and aeration, go ahead, put it a little high. It actually will help the plant drain better, stay above the um, underground water level if you're having a slow drainage. It'll help it to um, aerate better so more air gets in and, and kind of keeps oxygen going around those roots. It's very important that roots get their oxygen. So you would do the hole two to three times wider. Uh, here the ground only goes so deep before it hits either a rock, solid rock or a hard pan. Um, for most of us it's around two, sometimes three feet. Uh, if you're over there in Thumbview where you have boulders or over there in the dells, uh, it, it, it's, it's a big maybe. Who knows what will happen. The, those boulders that you're seeing, they're icebergs. You're seeing this great big boulder sticking out of the ground you say, wow, that's a big rock. Now that's just the tip. <laughs> you're actually standing on that rock, okay? So it's, you're, you're on one giant granite slab with a, a layer of, of dirt on top of it. And uh, so that's why you have all that disintegrated ground, grounded. And again, you'll notice quite often it does compact quite a bit. So because both the clay and the disintegrated granite have a tendency to compact so hard, what we want to do is take all that soil that we dug out of that hole and mix it with the premium mulch. It's made for amending that soil. It's going to help uh, keep that soil from recompacting so hard again. It's going to keep, uh, it's going to bring in those earthworms and get them moving around in there and, and, and prevent that compaction. It'll get a, a nice ecology going. Once the earthworms get in there and start moving around, then beneficial fungi, bacteria, will also start to do better, and you'll notice your plant takes up food better, thrives more, just does better. And the roots are able to move out in that soil. So you don't want to uh, replace the dirt. I get this question a lot. Everybody says, well, should I just, that, that dirt is so awful, I should just take it out of the hole and throw it away, right? Get, get new and replace it? Well, no, sooner or later, this plant has to figure out how to live in that dirt. So what you're just wanting to do is create a transition where it can root out, say, okay, I can handle this, and transition it to the, the, the soil. Um, a lot of you, they've been doing a lot of building lately. Um, you'll probably notice that uh, the way they build the houses is kind of in a stair step. What they're actually doing is they're scraping out all the topsoil. The topsoil is not that great to begin with, but they, they, they take that topsoil away and they cut into the mountains a little bit and then they bring in a lot of fill dirt and create the stair step effect to make the houses, make the yards a little flatter. That fill dirt they bring in, like I said, the topsoil wasn't that great to begin with, but at least it was something. <laughs> the fill dirt they bring in is worse. So you really got some nasty stuff in your yards. Real nasty. But you can work with that. If you mix in some, some mulch and some fertilizer, you can make that a livable soil, a breathable soil, something that this can actually thrive in, in spite of the fact that, like I said, it's, that's even worse than the natives have to, have to live in, literally. But you can work with that. You can also put these in pots. If you like to, to pot plants, roses look great in pots. I have several in pots myself of different sizes. I have carpet roses in smaller pots. I have shrub and hybrid teas um, in larger ones. They look beautiful, beautiful in pots. I do, yes, go ahead. If you're going to put in a pot, you're going to put a rose in that 
Okay, the question is, if, if we're going to plant a rose, should the pot be the same size? I would definitely go bigger. Um, and as the plant grows, you might even decide to go a little bit bigger too. Although since this has a, a finite size, you won't have to ever go into a huge pot. It will it'll only grow so big because of the type of rose that it is. You can put larger roses in pots. I would say, you know, um, I have a, a pot that's probably about Maybe about this wide, about that tall, and I got a nice big rose in there. It's gorgeous. So uh, if I had something really big in there, like a flora, you know, which are really big roses, I'd probably, you know, kind of keep it down to a, a smaller size. I don't think I'd go let it get to its full size. But yeah, absolutely. If you want to do pots, just decide what size pot you want, and then decide uh, which rose would do best for you. So you can absolutely do that, but go a little bit bigger. We actually have several questions already from the live stream. Oh, do okay. we? <laughs> um, first of all, somebody would like to, you to demonstrate how to prune at some point during the class. Absolutely. Okay, and then I have, I have another lady that's actually asked two questions already. How many months of the year will roses bloom? <laughs> and what is the best time to plant new roses? Okay. So the first question is uh, pruning. Now this is an important one. Um, the time of year, because a lot of you came from other states where the winters were a little more mild and you're in the habit of pruning your roses and other things during the fall. Here, because we get some pretty hard freezes during the winter, you can actually damage your rose by doing that. It should not um, be cut back and then allowed to go through a hard freeze. So what can happen is you'll, you'll get your rose and you know maybe it's nice and big and you, and you cut it way down and then the freeze will come and the tops of the branches are going to die back a, a little ways. So if the rose is up here and it dies back, that's okay because when you go and do your, your end of the winter pruning, then you cut up all that dead stuff and you're fine, the rose is healthy. But if you cut it all the way down and then it dies further back, now you're in danger of, of c c killing it all the way down to the base. So that's why you don't want to do it in the fall, you want to do it in the spring. So once those hard freezes are over, it's safe to prune. It's okay if you still get some snow and frost, that's okay. But you want to get the hard freezes over and done with. Generally they stop sometime in March. So if you wait until March to do your rose pruning, you should be safe. Um, for the next question I believe was how long do they bloom? This is one of the great things about roses. Uh, they bloom a long time. They generally start sometime in spring. Kind of depends on, you know, how how the weather has been going. It's a little bit different every year, but sometime in the spring, could be say April-ish. Um, sometimes sooner, sometimes later. If we're getting a lot of snow, it, it just depends. Somewhere in there, and then they keep blooming until frost. So long-term bloom very very good uh, bloomers so uh, that's one of the great things about roses so one of you know you, everybody has criteria that they want from their flowers that's often one of them I love roses because they meet so many of those criteria uh, was there one other question from the light yeah? uh, yes. yes. now when you're deadheading uh, how far back can you go? Okay. Go? Now the deadheading is something you would do throughout the blooming process. Yeah. Yes. So you want to go back. Um, deadheading is when you have a spit flower like these. You can see they're spit. They're done. They've uh, they're, they finished blooming. So we want to take those off. But if we were to just take them off like this, I'm using my fingernails to come to pinch these off. Do that as long as I do a nice shot, but uh, best to use a, a pair of snippers if you got them. And you can see um, you'll just have this kind of little spindly little stem sticking out, and that stem is too thin to really bloom again. It's not really gonna grow much of anything, and even if it does, it'll end up taking on a very leggy look. So rather than just stopping there, go a little bit further back to where. The old-fashioned rule is that you go back to where there's a five-leaf 
Now, sometimes you have to make a judgment call. If you feel that you want to go back a little further, that's okay. You can do that. But uh, there's one where we can see the stems a little bit better. That one is just so nice and full. That's a shrub rose. It's called an iceberg. And they have a naturally bushy look. The cane roses, uh, you'll notice more that if you just take the top of the flower off, it kind of looks like, like a stick is just sticking out. And it doesn't look very nice. Bring that back and, and make the whole bush look fairly shapely. So like if I were to take this one off, I probably, you know what, I might even take that all the way back to here or somewhere, somewhere in this area. Kind of make a judgment call. In this case, this particular kind of rose does clusters. So I'd be taking off that whole cluster, bringing it a down to where uh, you don't have a, a thin little stick just sticking out. It'll keep the, the rose healthier and much prettier looking. And it'll have sturdy stems to, to put new bloom, blooms on. And do that just as soon as they look like they're spent or even fading past the point where they're not pretty anymore. Immediately go ahead and do that because as soon as you take it off, now it can start getting ready for the, uh, the next bloom. Yes? I'm not sure I understood you when you were talking about sure. going down all the way. Uh, can you like take a third? Uh, ours is not, nothing has been. For the major pool. I mean, we bought a new house, nobody done anything uh -huh. to it. It's huge, out of control. Gotcha. Can you take it down a third? Yes. And then Absolutely. wait until, uh, you're saying probably April? I see what you're saying. Okay. Yeah. So your question is could you maybe just clean it up a little bit before the winter is over? Because it does look pretty messy. And I, I generally do that myself. I'll, I'll take a, at least the top off. Um, uh, of the roses and other plants, I'll just go ahead and give them a, a, a trim, a haircut. Get off all the, the wispy dead stuff, all the old flower hips, the, the, you know, just all of that scraggly looking stuff that starts getting really ugly in the, in the winter, and just kind of shape it up a little bit. Give it a haircut to where I'm comfortable with it, and then do a, a, a bigger pruning when those hard freezes finish. So by all means, yes, you can do that. Okay, and a third is kind of a good rule of thumb. A third is usually pretty yeah. safe. Um, it might depend on the size, but a third is, is typically safe. It's much taller than you are. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, you're, you're safe with a third. Even with a small plant, I mean, a third wouldn't be that much. It's so. been around yeah. for a while. Yeah. A third is, is, is okay. Boom. I mean. Yeah, when, you're, when you do the major pro pruning, a third is about all you'll have left. So, yeah, yeah. You're, you're safe with that. Any other questions about the pruning, deadheading? Did I explain that well enough? Do you leave the hips on like from October through the winter? Do you leave the hips on through the fall and winter? As a matter of fact, many of us do that simply because that's when you'll, you'll get um, your best hips for eating or making tea or herbal uh, blends or whatever. Yes, absolutely. What you want to do, if you're going to be doing that, um, when the flower is spent, um, it'll leave, leave behind what we call a hip, it, sort of a, a swollen um, bud look. And uh, basically, if you leave that on at the end of the season, and then you start getting some light frost, uh, you know, say October-ish, um, it'll start to swell up nice and big and turn red. That's when you want to harvest them those are going to be your best rose hips, are the ones that you harvest in the fall. So yes, that is absolutely what you want to do, if that's what you're going for. Um, uh, did, I think that was a third question. Uh, the, the other question was, what's the best time to plant? Rose? What is the best time to plant? There's almost no time when you can't, at least here. Um, I would say the spring uh, spring summer and and fall are definitely very safe spring monsoon season and fall are always your very best times to plant anything in this climate um, right now we're in monsoon season you'll find that you'll have fewer problems with newer plants um, drying up if, if you do it say earlier in the summer or late in the spring you'll, you'll notice that you'll get hit with this heat wave and 
and the newly planted things are going to have more trouble than the established ones. And you'll notice they're, they're getting a lot, of, a lot of brown on them and they're distressing. Um, it's harder to keep up with making sure that they are getting enough water. But if you do it during monsoon or fall, you just have fewer problems with that. Or if you do it earlier in spring. Uh, our roses come in in the spring. That is a great time to plant them. And they do seem to shock a little less than other plants. So they do really great here. We just don't seem to have as many problems with them when they get planted uh, as some of the others. If you've ever tried to plant a potentia in the early summer, you know, just don't even try. <laughs> <laughs> just don't either do it earlier or later you know, they just they just never seem to make it but um, the roses do us so much better so if you want to plant it in the summer you actually can you can actually do that uh, but the spring when they come in that's a great time to plant and that's when you're gonna find your best variety that's when the growers were planning to sell the roses they had were planning to have them all ready to ship at that time of year and that's when the garden centers all fill up with roses. So that's when you're going to find your best variety. After that, you know, if you can find them, find the variety you're looking for this time of year or later, that's great. You can still plant them. They do great going in the ground right now. Really good. Yes. Um, I just bought a house, and I, the previous owner had left the whole entire grounds for three years. The whole thing's been closed up. And I think I have the end guy here. You have a climber? I think so. Okay. It looks like it wanted to climb, but it's out of control, unmaintained, and I it's up off of White Spar. Mm -hmm. So it's like a thousand feet difference from where I was. Sure. Um, any tips? Yeah, so she has a climbing row. She just bought a house, and the, the previous tenant kind of let the yard go for about three years. And so now you have this climber that they do. They grow fast and they grow big and they get really woody. If they are not kept up with, they just get ugly. They, they, they look really wild and woody. Uh, so what you want to start doing is taking out the oldest, thickest, ugliest branches. You'll have to do this in stages because it's been allowed to go for so long. Take out the, the oldest and thickest branches first um, and then just kind of work on bringing the others down uh, further and every year take out more. Take out more of those old branches until you got just down to newer, fresher branches that bloom. Because the old ones, you probably notice they don't bloom much. They're ugly. I mean, they're just kind of gnarly and woody and then they just, they look half dead. And they don't look good. And so it's, it's just not a, a pretty sight. And so uh, you, you want to take out the old ones more, new ones will grow in, and then you'll take out more of the old ones, more new ones grow in, and finally you'll get it down to where you're, you've got fresher stock, everything's looking good. Um, and so you just, just kind of take it step by step. You know, it might, might, uh, might be something you work on for a while, just be patient, and you'll notice you start getting more flowers, more uh, foliage, uh, just a better looking plant. All right, yeah, this is, the, this is the climber. It is, you'll notice that it just kind of has this weird, doesn't seem to know which way it's trying to go. Yeah. They don't actually climb by nature. Uh, they just sort of ramble. <laughs> just, I'm, I'm just gonna go wherever, you know. And, and they, they're not a bush, they're, and they're not a climber. They're, they're just literally ramble. Yeah, just and, shoot. Yeah, so you actually have to, if you want them to climb, you have to actually, help them weave in between as they're growing when the stems are soft and flexible actually kind of hook them into the, the trellis or tie them to the trellis or something and actually help them climb they're not going to do it by nature so they are not a vine in reality that's the song rambling rose <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's the song rambling rose and a number of others as well so yes let's see now your, your um, hybrid teas and your climbing roses tend to be the ones that need the most selective pruning, where you're actually going to get in there and the first thing you want to do is take out your oldest canes. This is something you all want to do every year, whether your rose has been neglected or not. You take out your oldest canes. Take out canes that just don't look healthy, discolored, winter damaged. Take those out and then 
look at what's left and, and what you want to do is get down to about three to five main canes coming out of the base. That's what you're wanting. This is for hybrid teas and climbers. You want to get down to about three to five canes. That's going to maximize um, blossom production. Uh, so you start choosing which canes to take out. Take ones that are growing sort of inward rather than out. Um, throw, take out ones that are kind of crossing and competing with each other. You know, take one of those out so that one of them has room to do its thing. Uh, take out anything that seems to be growing down or in an unshapely way. If there's too many branches all on one side, you kind of want to thin those out. And just kind of use these tactics until you're down to that three to five, the, uh, three to five of the best branches. You want those canes, those are the ones that uh, you're gonna, gonna be using. And then you want to take the, the bush down and yeah, again with the climbers and the hybrid teas, you're probably looking at a couple of feet depending on its age. So from there, the, the plant can grow new stems, fresh green stems and canes and they're gonna look nice have uh, lots of foliage, they're going to have bigger flowers, they're going to have more flowers. So you'll find you have a, a, just a nicer, more attractive looking plant. Now if you have a shrub rose or a, or a carpet rose, the two of them are very, very similar except for size. So this right here is a shrub rose. Instead of having main canes, you just sort of have a whole bunch of canes coming out of the ground. These typically don't have a graft. The hybrid teas have a graft. They're grafted onto a wild rose called Dr. Dr. Huey, which is a very, a very tough, strong rose that helps, uh, it has a great root stock that can handle our tough soils and just make the whole plant healthier, easier to care for. The shrub roses, however, they tend to uh, just stick with their own root stock with these. Um, so they, and you'll notice that you have canes coming out of the ground instead of from a central point. With these, just take out old woody canes, um, canes that look like, yeah, they probably ought to come out. Just kind of shape it up. It's a little less work. You don't have to think about the pruning quite as much. You can still apply some of the rules from the hybrid teas, but uh, you, you almost can't really do it wrong. <laughs> with these, really, with none of them, you can do it horribly wrong. But um, the shrubs, a lot of people like the shrubs because they don't really have to think about it quite as much because it's not all coming from that central point. And it just makes a nice big bushy plant. Um, so the plant itself is very shapely by nature and blooms like crazy. The flowers aren't always quite as big, but there are lots of them. Yes. Yeah. When is the best time to plant that particular one? When is the best time to plant this to one? To start, yeah. Um, right now is a great time. Oh. Monsoon truly is a great time to plant. Um, because it's humid, which I know you've all noticed, it's humid, right? I mean, you can't stop sweating. You, you keep changing your outfits throughout the day. Uh, you know, just, it's wet. The plants love it, though. It really helps them through the shock. It does so much good for them. Um, they're just not as prone to um, losing too much moisture. When you try to do it in the heat of summer, when it's hot and dry, when it's really arid, um, again, the, the roses aren't quite as bad as other plants. They're, they do much better. But you'll notice with other, other plants especially, they seem to dry out real quick. And what's happening is that they're, they're transpiring. Um, moisture is evaporating from their leaves faster than the roots can take up water from the, the ground almost. So they're just feeling so dry and they get prone to scorching. An established plant doesn't have so much problem with that, but those new plants, they're just, uh, they, they've had their roots confined to that root ball inside the container, and they haven't quite grown out into the outer soil, so there's, this is all it has to live on. This is all the soil and water it has to live on. And so this is uh, kind of difficult for them. And so some plants are much more sensitive to, to it than others, but when you get into this humid, rainy part of the year, you eliminate most of those problems, yes. Like I said, the roses, they're so tough that you can almost get away with anything with these. <laughs> now, is that a good one if you want to try to do something with rose hips? Is um, that a yeah. good one to use? Yeah, some of the shrub roses make great rose hips. Okay. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That kind of sparked my interest. So. Okay. 
Yeah, basically try to go for the the plants that do have a somewhat larger flower. You know, the the carpet roses or the miniature roses have such a small flower. You're not going to get much out of that. So if you're wanting rose hips, go to the bigger roses. But yeah, some of the shrub roses make great hips. Um, the hybrid teas, of course, the ground yeah. uh, The wild roses, great. <laughs> yeah. Wild roses. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we actually do have a rugosa down there. Uh, or at least we did last time I checked. I think I saw it down oh, there. And those okay. are great for those. Yes. Okay. Yes. So um, I just moved into a house as well, and so, the, so you have a plant that's doing well. But then there's this other like root that's oh, I, I guess it's a cane that is part of it, but it's a ways from it. Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And it's got a different color of rose on yes. it, right? Okay. Yeah. So what she has, I'll get a grafted rose here. One way you can see the graft. This is going to get more soil in here. You'll notice at the base of this rose, like the hybrid teas, the granifloras, uh, a lot of the different types of roses, not the shrubs, but the, the cane roses. You'll notice there's a graft at the bottom. It's like a big knot, and then all of the branches are coming out of that for the most part. You have a branch that's coming out from under that or from away from that. It's coming up from the root or from the base under the graft. So basically they took, like in this case, this is Honor, I believe. Yes, Ooh, I can smell it too. <laughs> um, this is Honor, this is a, a white hybrid tea rose. They grafted it onto Dr. Huey, which is a wild uh, red rose. Not the prettiest, uh, you know, compared to, say, Honor. And so they, if, if it came tries to grow out from underneath the graft or from the root directly, that is not honor, that is Dr. Huey. Do so you're seeing that, that rootstock rose. It's not the, the rose that was grafted onto it. You're seeing something coming up from the rootstock. I would just cut that away. It'll happen from time to time. If you ever see a, a cane coming out from underneath the graft, just cut it off. It, and it's showing the, the rootstock rows. And it does happen sometimes. You can just cut that cane out. Yeah. It's not a real common thing, but every once in a while it'll do that. In really rare cases, um, something will go wrong where somehow the DNA from the rootstock rows takes over and the whole plant becomes Dr. Huey or, or whatever it was grafted onto. That has happened in really rare cases, but it's not at all common. I wouldn't worry about it. If you see it happen, sorry, <laughs> but it's not. I, I think I've met one person that it has happened to. Yeah, so maybe, maybe two. Okay. Uh, yes. I have a pot on my patio that's about this big around, about this tall. If I plant a rose in it, will it withstand the frost and the freeze during the yes. winter? Yeah. Don't have to put on it. No, I don't put frost cloth on mine. They do fine in the pots, even in my smaller pots. Um, they seem to do just fine. Um, I wouldn't prune it because the damage will happen at the tips of the stems mostly, um, and maybe even sometimes it will happen on the side of the stems. But again, during your let, let, end of the winter pruning, you can go ahead and take anything damaged out, and the inside should still be good. I, I do grow at that myself. Now, if you're in a particularly cold part of Prescott, and some of you are, uh, we're on the side of a mountain, and so Prescott goes everywhere from about 52 to 64. If you're in one of those colder areas, and you feel that you know it might be a little more sensitive, you could pull it up closer to the house. It, it can still be outside, but you'll notice that um, it, it gets radiant heat from the wall. So if you're having issues with that, then just go ahead and move it. But I personally have not had issues with potted roses dying off in the ro in the winter. They do just fine. Yes. I went here in the winter. Okay. So, what are the water requirements? And I imagine that could really vary depending on the weather we're having. You are absolutely but right. They turn off the irrigation in our development, okay. you know, during the winter. Got it. And since I'm not here all the time, I wonder about. 
so how these things are going to do. Either in winters do vary here. Right. Sometimes they're really dry, and the plants have to have water, or they will die. Okay. And it, during those drier winters, they need to be watered about every two weeks. Okay. And then you'll have other winters where you get lots of snow and rain, and you don't have to do anything. You know? So it does vary. If you're not here during the winter, I would say make friends with your neighbors. <laughs> So that they know that hey, you know, it's been a really dry winter. I need to go over to your house and right. and check on your landscape. Maybe turn on the water, uh, turn right. on the hose. If if your irrigation is being controlled by the development, right. then they would have to turn on right. the hose. So about, but once every two weeks or so should be sufficient. Yes, every two for... weeks is definitely sufficient in our winters okay. here. Um, we've never known it to need more than that. Okay. So I would say either hire a landscaper to come right. over and take care of things while you're gone or make friends with your neighbors. Right. Okay. <laughs> All right. Yes? Are there any uh, roses that are deer resistant? Are there any roses that are deer resistant? <laughs> <laughs> Um, generally, what will happen with the deer, now this is going to vary from year to year. Lately, uh, we've been in very severe drought, and so there's no water to drink, and there's not a lot of plants to eat, because without water, there's nothing growing. So you'll notice that they get more and more aggressive about eating your landscapes instead of staying out of the forest. During the better years, they'll nibble the tops of your roses. You know, they'll just kind of go for the tender, young, new growth. Um, it's softer, easier to eat, sweeter, juicier. They don't really want to go for the, the, the woody, uh, harder parts of the canes. So they'll just kind of nibble at them from time to time, and it won't be real severe. And a lot of times, you can just spray them with a, a repellent, and that's enough to keep them off. And it's pretty easy. Uh, this year and last year, past few years really, have been really, really bad. Um, so they're harder to repel. The repellents were still, we, we found that they were uh, still working a lot of time, but not always. You know, sometimes the, the deer were just so hungry or so thirsty that they would come in and say, well, I think I'm going to hold my nose and go for it. You know? So we did see more problems with that than ever. I, I don't know when we've last seen it this bad. Uh, but yeah, that's just the issue. So um, if, there, if you're having an issue with that, I would say try to use physical barriers first if, if that works. It's a little hard with deer because it can jump. But if you can somehow physically keep them from getting the rose, that would be great. Uh, if not, try the repellent, see if that will work. You'll have to reapply frequently. The rain's going to wash it off. <laughs> so. But, uh, and, and also as new growth comes out, then now that those new leaves also have to be sprayed. So you'll have to kind of be out there putting it on there. And it's basically something that smells and tastes bad. And you spray it on the plant and it, it makes it undesirable. Ask Google. Yes. Just a question. We have all kinds of issues, tried all kinds of things. Yeah. Most successful is a motion sensor sprinkler. Yeah, I, I've had other people go to that too lately because uh, they hate, everything they, else is... They hate it. Yeah. It's a thing that's on there. Yeah. They'll come back, but every time it goes on, they go on. For those of you who couldn't hear them, there's a sprinkler that you can buy. You just hook it up to your hose or your irrigation, stick it in the yard. It's got a motion sensor. And whenever someone or something undesirable comes off... <laughs> I don't know, sometimes I thought about getting one for my neighbor. <laughs> 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 yeah, <laughs> but it, it'll it'll shoot pretty far out. They'll get like 20, 30 feet, and they, and they can really, and it, it comes on suddenly, so the deer doesn't expect it, and it sprays this jet of water at them, and they'll they'll go ch -ch 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 -ch, like the old uh, lawn sprinklers you saw in California. Oh, yeah. We don't have those around here because we don't have lawns, <laughs> but uh, it'll it'll be like that. It'll scare the deer off. So those uh, have been effective. I haven't heard the greatest results. Well, I, I should say I haven't heard the most consistent results from the sonic type where they put out a sound. Uh, I've heard different things. So, what about light? What about light? Yeah. Again, different yeah. things. They're not consistent. Yeah. You can try them because they are fairly cheap. Yeah. You can give it a shot, see see if it works. Um, you know, deer are like any other animal. They can get wise to what you're doing. So. <laughs> And that's just you know, how it is. That's just a thought. I mean, different parts of the 
Yeah, there's so many different kinds of mechanical yeah. repellers. There's the kind of shoot water, there's the kind of make lights, there's the kind of make sounds. The, the sound types seem to work better on round squirrels, gophers, that sort of thing. But when it comes to the deer and javelina, yeah, try it, see if it works on your local herd. <laughs> All right. Anybody else? <laughs> let's see. What else do we still need to cover? We've gone over pruning. Oh, let's go over fertilizing. I have a quick question. Yes, Sorry. yes. Out in the bush, mm -hmm. and it's down in the valley. Okay. And you said that you don't have any questions. It's not so much because of the bottom, it's all very green. But it gets mildew every year. And I've sprayed and sprayed and sprayed, but it gets mildew. Yes. Yes. Okay. Have you ever, do you spray the, the fungicide after? or have you tried using it as preventative? Uh, no, when I see it, that's Okay, so when it comes to fungicides, and this is something we want to go over today because it is monsoon season, is fungus. Now this year has not been as bad as other years. Isn't that good here? And there's a few different types of fungicides. Now if you prefer to go organic, this is, uh, this is copper. And this is a uh, biofungicide. This is actually um, a bacteria that keeps the fungus down. It's beneficial bacteria. These are highly effective. Uh, copper fungicide has been one of our top selling fungicides for many years. Uh, this one we just started bringing in this year. I think we've had it in the past and it did pretty good. Uh, <clears throat> I haven't used it myself yet, but I hear it, it's, it's pretty effective and long lasting uh, as long as nothing's killing off the bacteria. That's where your inconsistency comes in with that. But it's also, it's organic and it's pretty effective when it's there. These are very good at keeping the fungus down. That includes powdery mildew, black spot. It's monsoon season. It's humid. It's rainy. It's making fungus go crazy. It's going to happen every single year. Fungicides work, can be used to stop mildew and fungus after they've already attacked, but they're far more effective if you use them as a preventative. And also then you won't have scarring because if the fungus is already there, whether it be powdery mildew or anything else, um, you spray it with the fungicide, the fungus goes away, but it's left scars behind on the leaves, so the plant's still kind of ugly. But if you use it as a preventative, you can take care of most of that before it even starts. So if you use them as a preventative, you'll find that they're more effective and they, they prevent more damage. Um, fungicides, of course, of these types, they can wash off in the rain. We're getting rain almost every day during the monsoon season, during a good monsoon season. This one's called Infuse. This will actually be absorbed a little bit into the leaf, into the, the skin of the leaf, so it doesn't wash off in the rain. So this is something you can apply, it's going to last for weeks. Um, what is it, is it six weeks, eight weeks? I can't remember. Four weeks. So it lasts for about four weeks. You don't have to worry about the rain washing it off because the leaf will actually absorb it a, a little ways into its skin so that it doesn't um, rinse off in the, in the rain. That is also highly effective. We've used it for years. It works great. It, it does. And I've even used this on more serious fungi, like say rust. That's kind of nasty stuff if you've ever seen that. Not, not very pretty. I've used it on that. Very effective. Now you will notice something. When you spray, uh, these right here are concentrates. So you have to mix them up and put them in your favorite sprayer. Uh, this one, you can buy in a concentrate or you can buy it in a, in a sprayer. When you spray this, you'll notice that it does something. It just sort of beads up on the leaf and rolls off. It doesn't really coat it very well. So you're, you're not really getting much effectiveness out of it. So we carry something called spreader sticker. I love this stuff really do. It is a wetting agent. You simply put about, depending on uh, what it is you're doing, usually around a quarter teaspoon of this, half teaspoon, into uh, whatever it is you're spraying, and it won't beat up and roll off anymore. You'll spray it on and you'll notice it actually coats the leaf and stays there so that it can do its job and you're not just wasting product and still having problems. So that might be the answer to all your troubles right there. Um, you know, sometimes hear about someone saying you can also use a drop of dish soap. Sometimes you can, sometimes uh, you might have to worry that the detergent can 
um, have a chemical reaction or something, because you know, there's more than just wetting agents in dish soap. This is, has no detergents, no chemicals, it's just the wetting agent. So that's why it's, it's safe to use. It's not gonna deactivate or react with your pesticide, your weed killer, your fungicide, whatever it is you're using. You can use this with all these different products. So, uh, yes. This, actually all you do is you put this into the product you're using. Just a tiny bit of it. You don't have to dilute it, now. So if I were to use this, if I, let me open this up. And I'll show you real quick. It'll say, uh, okay, it says if you're adding it to insecticides, use half a teaspoon. So uh, if I were to say use a multi-purpose insect control, I would take a half teaspoon of this. Well, I would mix up a sprayer of this and uh, put a half teaspoon into that uh, sprayer as well. Um, if it says for fungicides, again, use half a teaspoon. So let's say if I want this, I'll take a half teaspoon of this and put it in there, shake it up and start spraying. That's how it works. It's very, very simple. Um, it says for defoliants and desiccants, you know, weed killers, um, use one to two teaspoons. So you need to, to use a little bit more. So you can see this little bottle will actually go a really long way. You'll have this for a long time. It's just worth having on the shelf along with uh, all of the different sprays you have at home. It just works better. Um, since we're talking about insecticides, uh, right now uh, the heat has kind of brought the aphids down a little bit. You remember they were real bad in spring. Uh, some of you still have some pretty bad aphids. Um, aphids have kind of a waxy body, and so when you spray them with a, a pesticide, it tends to, again, beat up, roll off of them. This stuff seems to be one of the most effective. Uh, you, you can't really beat this right here, actually, for any of the insects. Multi-purpose insect control, very, very effective. And again, you can use it with the spreader sticker. If it's just not sticking to them, just half a teaspoon of that into the spray bottle, problem solved. No issues there. But I find even, even without it, this stuff it really seems to work. But it's, it's safe. You can use it around the home. You can use it around the vegetable garden. You can actually spray it on your vegetables. You can spray it on your fruit trees. It's very safe. It's actually the same ingredient that they put in a lot of um, uh, flea and tick treatments for your dogs. So your vet will actually put this stuff into his coat. What is that called? This is multi-purpose insect control. It, it's very, very safe but highly effective. Uh, there's a... Um, now this, won't, th this doesn't just apply to the roses. It's August and very soon, any day now, it could be today, you'll go home and there'll be caterpillars. Some of you will find caterpillars everywhere. It sounds like you've been there. <laughs> and just as they're, they're little fuzzy, very, very furry caterpillars, they break out every August and they start devouring everything and they're crawling all over the yard, the walls of the house, up the trees. And you guys call me up and say, what is going on? My yard looks like a horror movie. I get this every year. But that's, they, they break out every August. This will work on them. It's very effective. In fact, if you know, if you've been having a problem every year, I would say use uh, one of these products as a preventative. Just go ahead and spray it on right now. Just do it right now. Spray the whole tree down, whole yard, whatever it takes, because you know you're gonna get them. If, if you've been getting them every year up to, up to this point, this one's a thuricide. This is actually a, another beneficial bacteria that only affects caterpillars. Nothing else, just caterpillars. So, these can be used in a preventative manner. Um, another one that breaks out every August, and again, it's always like right in the first week of August, blister beetle. It's a long-bodied beetle. Please don't touch it if you see it. Um, it'll give you blisters. It's actually got a little chemical that it exudes. It'll give you a blister if you touch it. Um, but it's a long-bodied beetle. Comes out first week of August, never fails. Defoliates whole trees. I mean, it's just a swarm will come out of nowhere into your yard, defoliate a whole tree, bushes, everything, and then fly off. Because they come and go so quick, this is the one you want because it, it's a faster acting. You don't want to deal with trying to use it as a 
preventative because, yeah, they'll die, but. <laughs> this is a multi-purpose, yeah. The multi-purpose is, is, is a good contact killer and it also has a little bit of a preventative measure as well. So you can spray it on the plant and then when something tries to come along and eat it, you've got a stomach full of this. Um, sometimes it'll even, the smell will even be enough to make the, the insect think twice about eating it sometimes. But uh, a very effective contact killer, quick acting. So if, if you see blister beetles swarming all over, say your butterfly bush or your, your big tree, your shade tree in the yard, you don't want something that takes a long time to kill them because they'll have time to, to do a lot of damage. It takes them about an hour if the swarm is big enough to defoliate a tree. So that's when you want a quick acting, effective, but safe thing that you can spray. Multi-purpose insect control is the one I'm going to recommend every time. Does it do anything for grasshoppers? Does it do anything for grasshoppers? If you can manage to spray it on the, on the grasshopper as it's hopping around, absolutely, yes. <laughs> There's a lot of uh, insecticides that just don't work as well on grasshoppers. Or those really big beetles, they have such a thick shell that it's really hard to kill them. And they don't absorb pesticides like the other insects do. But this one will work. This will actually work on those bigger insects. Again, while still be safe enough that you can go out there and not feel like you need to wear a hazmat suit. <laughs> so very effective. Is yes. that safe around pets? Is it safe around pets? Yes. Does yeah. that Yes, this is the concentrate. So yeah, it'll give you directions to dilute it. It's generally one to two tables, uh, one to two ounces per gallon. Yes. All right, any other questions? I'm gonna go over one more problem that you're all gonna be seeing soon, except you won't see it at first. You won't see it until it's too late. <laughs> Grubs. Now those of you who have just moved in, you're all going to say what you always say. You have grubs here? <laughs> yes, we do, we do. Grubs are actually beetle larvae. So any place that has um, big beetles crawling around on the ground can have grubs. And they get into everything. There's nothing they won't attack. Trees, bushes, roses, lawns, you name it, they're going to get into it. There's always a big outbreak after monsoon of them, but you don't notice the damage right away, and then in winter they all go to sleep. They just kind of <laughs> dig down, go to sleep for the winter, kind of hibernate, and then in about January or February, you'll get a, a, a warm spell and they'll start to wake up. And then they start eating the roots of your plants. This is what they do. You can't tell anything's wrong because everything's dormant. You can't see symptoms on a dormant plant. So you can't tell anything's wrong until spring when you notice, why is nothing leafing out? You have this plant that's just sitting there, no leaves, no flowers, what's going on? That's grubs. A lot of people say, oh, it didn't survive the winter, it must have frozen. No, that's a, that's a cold hardy plant. It did not freeze during the winter, not unless it was dehydrated. And if it's dehydrated, that means you either didn't water every two weeks during the winter, or you had grubs eating away the roots so the plant could not take up water. And it died of dehydration because it had no roots. So this, this is that time of year when the beetles are all laying their eggs. They love doing it in mass during the monsoon. Just huge hordes of them. You'll notice there's beetles everywhere. You go out, they're all over your porch. Or they're everywhere, right? That's what they're doing. They're looking for places to lay eggs in the ground. And then you won't see the effects of it until it's too late. So that's when you want to get some grub killers. There's, there's different types. We carry a couple of them. Very, very effective. Are they in, are they in all kinds of soil? All kinds of soil. Yes. Yes. What about pets? What about pets? Um, this stuff is going to go into the ground. Now this one right here is a chemical. This here in the bag. Um, it's, it's kind of a low-level chemical. You can put that in a different way. It's not a strong concentration of the chemical. This one right here is organic, totally safe. I mean, you could pour this on your pet and it wouldn't hurt him. So just very, very, very safe if you're at all concerned. I would say both of them would be safe enough to use in the yard if you have pets. 
But if you're really concerned, especially if you have a dog that digs and rolls in the dirt and you just you really want to have peace of mind, then just go with the organic and you won't have any issues. Both of them are, are pretty effective though. So either of those would be fine. So yes. This one's granule. This one you throw on the ground and then you water it in, or if you do it right now, the rain will do it for you. <laughs> And uh, it'll it'll go into the into the soil where the grubs are because most pesticides they need to be sprayed on it or on their foods on, either on the grubs or on their food source but they're down in the ground where you can't spray them. so you need something that can go into the soil this can do it um, this one can do it I know this looks small that's because um, this is actually a certificate you, you purchase the certificate and then you turn it in for the actual. Um, uh, Product, thank you. <laughs> it's because the product is alive. It's a microbe that uh, parasitizes grubs. Will not harm earthworms or anything beneficial, only the grubs. That's it. Very safe. Um, but because it is alive, it has to be refrigerated. So I can't have them, you know, just out here in the sun. So that's why I'm holding up the certificate. <laughs> but you, uh, you, you can get your, your, they're called nematodes, and you can get them within just a few days. So, very, very effective. I use it myself at home. This is the grub killer that I use. It's the one I like. It lasts a long time, too. Yes. Do you sprinkle it on the plants as well as the dirt, or just the... In some cases, uh, depending on um, how the product was made, in this case... Um, no, uh, this one, if you, if you were to leave it out in uh, the sun, it would just kill off, kill off your microbes. There are products similar to this where you can do that. But this isn't one of them. Well, Nematodes. Just, just tell, come in and say, I want that organic <laughs> grub killer, and, and and you'll be able to get it. All right. Um, anything that we haven't covered yet? No handout. Um, if we don't have any printed out right now, right? No, right. But well, uh, what we do is the, email, the sheet that you sign. Mm -hmm. That'll come out on Thursday, mm -hmm. and that will be where the handouts are. There'll be a link. Okay. to the website and then you can print the handouts yourself. Could I just ask one uh, question back about pruning? Mm -hmm. I had read that there's a certain way to, to cut. Yeah, yeah, it's a 45 degree angle. Yeah. Okay. Now, and lately the there has been about, like, oh, you know, and the bud is this way and all this stuff, but just don't worry about that. Um, I'm going to be perfectly honest. Lately there's been some um, debate over that. Okay. You know, the, the old uh, instruction was always, I'll go for the 45 degree angle and this and that, and now some of the rose experts are saying, no, I think it's better to do a straight cut. So don't worry, you're not gonna kill it by doing it one way or the other. <laughs> um, I would say this, however, and I've learned this from experience, um, cut, it, 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 cut a stem that is more than uh, a pencil thickness, do put a pruning sealer on it, to keep the uh, the bores from getting in. There's a rose bore that will bore down in there and it'll get down into the graft and kill your rose. So um, I, for a while, wasn't using it and lost a, a rose that way. I mean, it didn't die off completely, but it, afterwards it was so ugly that I, I had trouble getting it back to looking like anything and I finally had to give up on the stupid thing. So this is an experience talking, seal up your cuts if they're thicker than a pencil. What was made, uh, not the whole bush, but a few leaves in the rose bush brown and dry? Could be a number of things. Um, if you're just losing a few, few leaves, it might just be, you know, a temporary stress from the environment. If they're on the inside, if they're turning yellow, a lot of times that'll be water issues. Um, but it could just be that, you know, it, it's shedding some old leaves because now they're not getting as much sunlight. You know, you've got all these leaves out here. And so the leaves on the inside may not be getting as much light, so the plant just kind of gives them up. So it depends on what the circumstances are. It may not be anything to really worry about at all. That's another thing. Uh, on the leaves, if they're yellow, are they getting too much water or not enough water? Usually that means uh, not too much if they're yellow. Or sometimes, it, you know, especially like this time of year, you're getting a lot of rain. Make sure you fertilize. That will help it handle that a lot better. Um, did you remember to turn off your irrigation is the other thing. A lot of people forget to do that. 
it's monsoon, turn off the irrigation. <laughs> Will you talk about fertilizer? Yeah, yeah. So there's a few different kinds of fertilizers. Um, you've probably noticed that you go into some garden centers and there's like 50 different fertilizers. That's really not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> if it's a good fertilizer, it'll fertilize a lot of different things, not just one thing. So uh, this one right here, it, it says uh, all-purpose. This is the one I personally use. I love this stuff. I use it on my whole landscape. I use it on the pots. I use it on the stuff in the ground. I put it on everything. It's got all the macronutrients in the right balance. That's your three numbers up here. So there's always three numbers on the front of every fertilizer and fertilizer supplement. Um, this is a, a, a very good balance. This is what the plants need. Um, it also has micronutrients. Not all fertilizers have that. A lot of times you have to buy a, a fertilizer and then you have to buy these supplements. It's kind of like buying vitamin pills for yourself. You know? This actually has all of it in there. It's a complete meal. So this is the one I use. It's, it's our name brand. Ken has spent years perfecting this fertilizer and he did a really great job. He got together with some friends that are, you know, great soil experts in the business and they just they worked on this for a long time getting it to perfection and they did a great job. So this is what I use. You can um, there are uh, again different kinds. This one right here is uh, not the one we've created but it's it's a, a, a good fertilizer if you want something with a pesticide built in. So that's what this one is. And then this right here is something that, in the case of roses, you can supplement the phosphorus if you would like. If you're having issues with not getting as many blooms as you would like to see, I would say keep using this, but you can supplement with a phosphorus supplement like the Flower Power uh, Bone Meal Super Phosphate. Think about the, the bone meals and the superphosphates and those those powder types, they take a while to kick in, especially bone meal. That's something that takes several months to, to start kicking in. This is something that will go to work right away. So if you're not seeing as many blooms as, as you should, this right here will just bump up that phosphorus count. That's your middle number. This is a 1054 10, so huge phosphorus count right there. It will. 105410. This isn't synthetic, but it's, it's highly effective. So we put all the phosphorus we could possibly manage to get into this thing. So it will make you blue. 